The Bible is not supposed to be easy to read. The Bible was written to be difficult to read. This is part of the journey for the initiate to surmount the mysteries presented within its stories and discover their true mystical or erudite meanings. The Bible is meant to be difficult to read, but that said, it is meant to be read and understood. What astrology is really all about is astrologic. It's the study of the stars. And ultimately, what astrology is, is a study of time. The heavens above, when we look up, the heavens above are the manifestation of the metaphysical, the immaterial, and the spiritual, as the heavens may be defined exactly as such. It's beyond the physical. Meta meaning beyond, physical meaning, of course, the physical, the material plane here. No man, regardless of the absurdities proposed by modern-day so-called space agencies, has ever traveled to or stepped foot on the moon, Mars, or otherwise. No being has ever left the firmament or transcended the physical plane in a physical body. The heavens above, the luminaries, the sun and moon, the lights in the sky are all beyond the reach of man, and hence, they are metaphysical, meaning that they exist beyond the physicality and materiality of the earthly dimension. The opening lines of Psalm 19 truly define and announce the glory of the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. These verses, along with countless others throughout the good book, specifically point the spiritual seeker to seek knowledge and wisdom in the stars, to look up. The Holy Bible is not mincing words when it comes to recognizing the importance of God's night sky and the lights within it. The stars of the firmament, the cycles of the luminaries in heaven, the sun and the moon, all form a monomythical story, a scripture in the stars, one which is available for all eyes to see. So we're going to do a lot of star study today, okay? One of the things you will need to know is this notion that you have the constellations of the zodiac placed on the human being and ultimately there's a deep meaning here that man is a reflection of the stars this is the zodiac man if you're not familiar with this if you don't understand this general you know this once again anthropocosm zodiac man if you don't understand this just even the basics of it even the attributions of what constellations to which body part it's like okay i know gemini's you know aries in my head i got my aquarius down here all of that right if you don't understand that I'm, I'm just going to say this. There's no way you could possibly understand the deeper meanings of the Bible. There's just no way for you to really do it. And I'm just telling you this from experience because I didn't understand it for the longest time, and now it makes sense. And this, as you know, I showed a bunch of pictures here. This is all over esoteric literature. You know, when, whenever you get to anybody who really knows, you know, their stuff when it comes to esoterica, you will find this. I just want to talk about a few places that I've covered before that shows clearly and explicitly, you know, without question or controversy, that you can't even understand what you're reading unless you bring astrology to bear on it. This is Revelation 4, 4 to 4, 8. And round about the throne were four and 20 seats. Well, there's 24 seats. Well, what are they trying to reveal to you? What are they pointing at? 
It's the 24 hours of the day. There were four beasts, and the beasts had, they were full of eyes before and behind. What are these beasts doing? They're looking into the future and into the past, and they're going round about in 24 hours. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face of a man as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. How do we know we're talking about a star study here? Well, we had a lion, we had a calf, we had a face of a man and a flying eagle. Now this is called the tetramorph. You know, this is a common thing and you'll see this in architecture all over where the four apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are given the attributions of constellations. And they're the actual, they're the fixed signs of the zodiac. Uh, human, eagle, lion, bull, that's exactly what we're dealing with here. We had the face of a, you know, lion, calf, face of a man, flying eagle. Of course, that's Scorpio, Aquarius, Leo, and Taurus. Scorpio is usually known as the Phoenix or the Eagle. It's interchangeable. It's one of those constellations that are interchangeable. And it even says uh, the most common interpretation is St. Gregory in the Book of Kells is that man, uh, the man of Aquarius is Matthew, lion is Mark, the ox is Luke and the eagle is John. And the creatures of the tetramorph, the four gospels of the evangelists, represent the four facets of Christ. In Revelation, I believe this is, do I have this? 12, one to 12, four here, 12, three, it says, there was a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head and um, uh, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. So we had a great red dragon, a big you know, beast, a serpent beast up there, and it had a bunch of heads, and it was huge. It's his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, Revelation tells us, right? And it says, I saw as one of his heads, as it were, were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Tried to kill the thing, was wounded, and it was healed. It healed itself automatically. So it cut the head off, it would grow another head, if you will. The constellation that they're mentioning here is Hydra. Hydra is the water snake. It's the largest constellation in the sky. Hydra is the water snake. It is the largest constellation in the sky. So when it says things like, you know, having seven heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, they're, 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 they're pointing to you a specific constellation in the sky. And that's Hydra. And the thing about Hydra is a multi-headed creature. So it had many heads and you can, and one of the things it would do is that if you cut the head off, it would automatically grow another head. And then of course, this dragon gave power to another beast. This beast gave, got his power from another beast. What's the other beast? It's Draco. It's Draco. And that is the constellation. It's a big serpent in the sky that's constantly revolving around the center of the heavens, the throne, the center of the heavens. What you can see is there's a revelation in the sky. The, the revelation that St. John was having was he was looking up in the sky and he's like, oh, I get it, I see it. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. What are we talking about here? We're talking about Draco was the dragon. The beast I saw which like was unto a leopard and that's camel lepardus. It's literally a camel leopard. Um, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Well, that's Ursa Major. Feet of a bear right there. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion. Well, that's the constellation Leo. It's right there, the mouth of a lion. Notice Hydra's right there. That's the, that's the other beast that's getting its power from Draco. Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. When we talk about the wilderness, what does wilderness mean? Well, it's a tractor region uncultivated and uninhabited by human beings. 
an area essentially undisturbed by human activity. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the stars. It's undisturbed. No physical being in the body has ever been up there. And that's why NASA and JAXA and ESA and all of these space institutions, space institutions, hard quotations there, of course, are all trying to convince you that that's materiality up there. We can go up there and land on moons and have rovers going around on Mars. It's nonsense. Nonsense. In Mark, it's even telling you, it's like, hey, where are we right now? The voice of one God crying out the word. And he, where is he? In the wilderness. And they were baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Jordan is a unique name of both Greek and Hebrew origins. And in Hebrew, the name means to flow down or descend. To flow down or descend. And so here's a big river and it's called Aratinus. And what is this river doing? Well, it's descending down. That's exactly what it's doing. It's descending down to the south in our sky. It's a river that's going and descending down. They're baptizing them in the river Jordan. That means to descend to go down. That's the constellation Aratinus. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. That sounds doesn't sound very good. So in Cancer, there's a, there's a cluster of stars that's been long known as the beehive. So John was out there and he was eating uh, wild honey. He was clothed in camel hair. Clothed in camel hair and a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts. Well, where's the locusts? Well, that's the constellation Lacerta. Lacerta is the name of a genus of lizards, a family in Lacerta Day or whatever. Probably also Latin, Lacosta, Lacosta, grasshopper, locust, locust. But he also had a girdle about his loins. And what's a girdle? It's a belt or cord around the waist. If I was going to ask you, what's one constellation in which there's known as a belt, would everybody in here be like, well, Ryan's belt? Correct? And a girdle looks like this. And you know, there you go. <laughs> so that's a girdle. Well, we have Orion and his girdle about his loins. We're in the chapter of Mark, which is the lion. We got the wild honey right there, the beehive. We got camels here and we got locusts. And John was clothed with camel's hair, that's camel lepardus, and with the girdle of skin about his loins, that's Orion. And he did eat locusts, which is Lacerta, and wild honey, which is the beehive, a cluster of stars, and cancer. Mark 3.17 says, And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. So we got two brothers here, John and James, and he surnamed them Boanerges. Boanerges, which is the son, sons of thunder. So we already know that John, the disciple, Apostle John, is represented as Scorpio, the constellation Scorpio. Mark is the winged lion. Of course, Leo. Luke is the winged ox, which is, of course, Taurus. Matthew is the winged man, which is, of course, Aquarius. Let's read this once again. Mark 3, 17 says, And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, a couple brothers, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Okay, Boanerges, New Testament is a nickname applied by Jesus to James and John in Mark 3, 17, a fiery preacher, especially one with a loud voice. Well, what's the sons of thunder? Zeus had a thunderbolt that was held by a bird. It was a bird, an eagle, that held Zeus's thunderbolt. Now, Zeus is known as Jupiter. Once again, there's really no question about this. Zeus is direct correlation to Jupiter. 
Then we have Aquila, which is the bird that carries the thunderbolt. Zeus slash Jupiter's thunderbolt was carried by this eagle named Aquila. The house of Zeus slash Jupiter is Sagittarius. So the zodiacal sign of Sagittarius is the ruling planet Jupiter. Jupiter is the ruling house of Sagittarius. So Jupiter's house is Sagittarius. Jupiter, Zeus, Sagittarius, there's a bird, there's a thunderbolt, that's Aquila, and then his right hand is holding the thunderbolt. So in other words, Zeus, Jupiter, it's in the house of Sagittarius, has an eagle, which is the constellation Aquila, and he's got it, he, Sagittarius, he's the archer, and right next to Aquila, this bird that's carrying Zeus's thunderbolt is a constellation called Sagitta, that's literally, in this sense, the, the arrow. Sagitta is a constellation usually associated with the arrow that Hercules used to strike down the eagle that Zeus sent to Noth. Let's go back here and let's read Mark again. And he's surnamed James and John, which we already know John is Scorpio, Scorpio slash eagle. So who's James? James is Sagittarius. And he surnamed them Fiery Preacher or with a loud voice, a powerful voice. Well, John's got a powerful voice because he's, he's announcing the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. His brother, which is right next door to Scorpio, is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is a fire sign, right? It's a fire sign. So they're fiery preachers, and they're the sons of thunder. Now let's go, let's look up into the canopy of stars and let's make sense of this whole thing. So Sagitta is the constellation which is an archer. That's an arrow. Sagitta is the arrow and that's right above the eagle, Aquila. So in other words, there's an arrow and a bird with a thunderbolt. And that Sagitta is mating with Aquila to create the sons of thunder. You have Sagitta, which is the arrow, the archer's arrow, right above Aquila, the bird, which is carrying the thunderbolt. And right, th those two are mating. And of course, when Sagitta mates with Aquila, I, the sun is probably called Sagitta Rius. There's Sagitta mating with Aquila, producing the sons of thunder, which is Scorpio and Sagittarius, which is James and John. Why is it important that they're pointing to these two constellations? When you, when you look up at the Milky Way, there's like what they call, once again, it's like a galactic bulge, just what the new terminology is or whatever. It's basically just, you know, this mass of stars that is formed around a great multitude that's formed around the center of the Milky Way. So we've got James and John, and they're pointing to the center of the Milky Way, the, the river of stars, the Great Rift. There's the center of the Milky Way, if you will, where there's a big, you know, dark rift in the sky, a mass, a cloudy mass of stars. Boom, there's your brothers, sons of thunder. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. We have to go find a sower up above. We have to find a guy upstairs who is sowing the seeds. And that is, we'll call him Boots. It's, the real name is Bo, Bootes. I think is how you say that. Bootes is the, is the constellation Bootes. We're going to call him Boots today, though. Now, Bootes is classically known in Greek myth to be the plowman, the herdsman. Bootes means the plowman. Every day, Bootes dug up the soil in his fields to make rows for his crops. He was a farmer. Uh, a plower plow is a farm tool for loosening or turning the soil before sowing seeds. And some of these seeds that Boots was sowing, they fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth. So if you see, um, Hercules is right there. So Boötes is literally just left to the, where it's a stony ground there, okay? So Boötes is literally right there. If you see Hercules, this is a main, it's called an asterism. An asterism is a group of stars, usually about like four stars or whatever, that is um, really noticeable in the sky. They use asterisms to locate other stars. The asterism of Hercules is literally called the keystone. Right up top of Hercules 
is Ophiuchus. And Ophiuchus, that's another star asterism right there. And it's called the coffin. Hercules has the keystone and right above is coffin. Well, what a coffin is gravestones, right? So there's your stony ground. The verse right before it, it says, And it came to pass, as he sowed, as Boethi sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. What are the fowls of the air? Well, that's Aquila, which is a big bird, and Cygnus, which is another big bird. So here you have a very reasonable, very common sense explanation of what's exactly going on with the parable of the sower. And the sower is boots, right? Bootes. The stony ground is exactly where Hercules and the coffin is and stuff like that. And then just to the right of them, you got a couple fowls in the air. So we've mentioned many times throughout the last five, whatever, four or five live streams or whatever, uh, about the fact that, hey, we're talking about the waters above, the canopy of the waters above. Okay, so then they keep mentioning ships. They got into the vessel, they went into the ship, he went into the sea, he went into the sea, he went into the ship. What are they talking about, okay? And this is known as the ship. It's called Argo Navis. Argo Navis is actually three constellations. So these are the sections of the boat. So there's three aspects of the ship. There's the aft and the stern. We have the sail, which is the vela, and we have the keel, which is the bottom portion of the ship, and that's called the carina. This Argo Navis is skimming along the river of the Milky Way. So there's your Milky Way River, the river of the Milky Way. Argo Navis is sailing on that river. There's the ship and it is sailing the seas of the Milky Way. It's literally up and down the river of the Milky Way. Mark 5, 2, it says, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So went out of the ship, went to the tombs, and met a swine. Then it says it again, Mark 5, 3 says, Who had his dwelling among the tombs. Yeah, there's a bunch of illustrations of this, that Jesus is he's amongst the tombs. Well, what are the tombs? Once again, all we have to do is go upstairs into our canopy of the stars above, which is where we are anyway, and we can find a star asterism, the coffin, the coffin. So when Jesus was in, they were in the ship, and they were sailing the seas, and then they went to this place where they were in the tombs, right? Well, the first place that they go, you can see Ophiuchus is right to the right there, and that's literally called a coffin. Then right above that is Delphinus. Delphinus is up there, so we got the coffin of Ophiuchus, Delphinus. Delphinus is the four stars that make up the coffin. So Delphinus, there's a coffin there. So we have Ophiuchus, which is a coffin, and we have Delphinus, which is a coffin. And then we have Argo, Navis, the ship. And so now we know exactly where we are in the Bible. It says Mark 5 here, out of the tombs, among the tombs, no man could bind this guy. No, not with chains because he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Mark 5.5 5 says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Cutting himself with stones. That's Hercules. What, the Hercules right there is the constellation right by the coffin of Delphinus, right, or right by the coffin of Ophiuchus, right across from Delphinus, which is Job's coffin. Job's coffin. This is your wild man. This is your man that could not be tamed. Well, and always night and day, he was in the stars above. It doesn't matter if it's night or day. Guess where he is? He's up in the canopy of the stars. And he was in the mountains. He was at the high place. He was at the tippy top. And in the tombs, Delphinus Ophiuchus, the coffins. And he was cutting himself with stones. Now, 
Where is the keystone in Hercules? It's literally in his torso. It's literally in his torso. He's cutting himself with stones. He's, he's in the wild. No, he look at him. He's running around. No, he's a wild man. No man can tame this guy. Keystone is an asterism formed by four relatively bright stars in the constellation Hercules. Asterism represents Hercules' torso. He was cutting himself with stones. Mark 5, 6. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. What is, what is Hercules doing? Oh, he was running. <laughs> There's Hercules running. Now there was nigh unto the mountains, high place, a great herd of swine feeding. What do swine feed out of? If you live on a farm, you already know that what a trough is. It's what animals eat out of. The word actually refers to the shape of the container and can mean anything that is low or hollowed out. Where is the trough here? The trough is the Big Dipper. It's Ursa Major. Now, all of this comes from this whole thing that we're reading right now is a retelling of a Grecian myth. And it's called the, uh, what is it called? Oh, Aramanthian boar. In Greek mythology, the Aramanthian boar was a mythical creature that took the form of a shaggy and wild, tameless boar of vast weight. So basically, it's this big beast or animal. Notice the relationship to the word boar and bear. Boar, bear. Those are all beasts up there. What do you think the Ursa Major is? A bear. It's a big beast. So there's, once again, there's Hercules chasing, literally going around and around, 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 around. The big bear or boar, and this is, this is the myth. So Hercules chased the boar round and round the mountain. He did. Look what he's doing. Round and round the mountain, shouting as loud as he could. He was crying out. This is all a retelling of this tale. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. How many times are they going to say damsel here? And straightway the the damsel arose and walked. This daughter is a, is a damsel, as we see. Damsel, 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 damsel. And he even goes on to say that the father and the mother of this damsel. So we already know that Jairus here, Jairus here has a daughter. This whole thing, the rest of this chapter, is all a retelling of, once again, a Grecian myth. Star theology, if you will. And what it is, is the story is um, Cassiopeia and Cepheus. Cassiopeia and Cepheus are the, they are king and queen of Ethiopia or Ethiopia. Cassiopeia and Cepheus right there. So there's the two constellations that we're looking at, okay? So Andromeda, Cassiopeia, and Cepheus. So there's the king and the queen. King Cepheus, Cassiopeia had the daughter Andromeda. She, a, a daughter of no, like royalty or nobility, right? Which is what a king and queen is. Cepheus, Cassiopeia is, is literally defined as a damsel. A woman of Royal birth in distress, in despair. The reason that we're focused on these constellations right now in this story is that these constellations make up or point to, once again, the pole star, okay? These are what is known as circumpolar constellations. So Andromeda is not necessarily a circumpolar constellation, but her mother and father, the king and queen of Ethiopia, Cassiopeia and Cepheus, absolutely are. So Cassiopeia and Cepheus are circumpolar constellations. Five of the major circumpolar constellations, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Draco the Dragon, two bears, a dragon, um, serpent, and then Cassiopeia, king and a queen, essentially. 
And these are your circumpolar constellations. So his daughter lieth at the point of death. So there's Jairus, that's Cepheus. And Andromeda, which is Jairus' daughter, is at the point of death. What's the point of death? Well, Andromeda literally lays, lies at the point of death. Daughter, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. What's the point of death? It's the constellation right by Andromeda. It's triangulum. She's lying at the point of death. There's his daughter lying at the point of death. Jairus' daughter, this is Andromeda. Andromeda is always shown, or more often shown, um, tied to a mountain. She's chained to two pillars of, or a mountain. There's Andromeda again, chained to a mountain, two pillars. The damsel in distress is a recurring narrative, a de device or trope in which one or more men must rescue a woman who has either been kidnapped or placed in great peril. Of course, we see this all over. There's a dragon, there's a woman that's in peril, she's in distress, she needs to be saved. Princess and dragon is a generic premise. Of course, we also know of Saint Michael, the dragon slayer. There is Andromeda, the princess and the dragon. Now, who's the dragon? That's Draco. Draco, big dragon circling the heavens. And you're a warrior. And you gotta go fight that dragon and get to the center of the thing and free the woman. Right by the pole star. We've got a big serpent, a big dragon that's circling around that pole star. And that's the old serpent, the devil. And what is that Draco doing? What is that dragon doing? What is that old serpent doing? It's trying to keep you from your center. That story's in the heavens. Mark 5, 41 says, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Talitha Kumi. Talitha is a star in the constellation Ursa Major. Ursa Major is one of those circumpolar constellations. The ladle, if you will, the trough of Ursa Major is pointing to the pole star. Right next to that trough is a, is a star called Talitha. Talitha Kumi, I say unto thee, arise. What's arise? It's the constellation of Aries. Let's go back to his sisters. Jesus has got some sisters. Who are the sisters? Well, once again, we talk about, hey, we're in the canopy of the stars above. This is the Pleiades, okay? They're known as the seven sisters, and it's northwest of the constellation Taurus. The Pleiades were seven sisters. This is the Grecian myth, the titan commanded by the god Zeus to hold up the earth. So the Pleiades and these sisters held up the earth. We've spent the last six live streams talking about we're in the stars all day long. And then, of course, we look for the seven sisters, and then the Bible doesn't even mention who these sisters are. That seems like pretty important information that they seem to be leaving out, doesn't it? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Now, let's talk about why Jesus is a carpenter. So Norma, this is the constellation in the southern hemisphere. Norma is a small constellation in the southern celestial hemisphere and is variously considered to represent a rule, a carpenter's square, and a set of square or a level. Jesus is the carpenter or the carpenter's son. This is, as you can see, you see that like dark little spot there? You know what that is? That is the Milky Way. Argo Navis is the ship. And that's the constellations Carnia, Vela, Pupus. So this ship is sailing the seas of the ocean above. And it's on the river of the Milky Way. And it's going along. And we see here, there's the carpenter. And right next to the carpenter is the Southern Crocs. The Southern Cross. carpenter, Norma, is this is the carpenter square, is going to die and be reborn on that cross and he's going to lift that light up through the human vessel, through the temple of the human body, all the way up to the tippy top, the high point. 
And of course, what is he going to do? He's going to lift a serpent up, just as Moses did. And of course, when we take from the southern hemisphere, and this is the south, this is the southern hemisphere, and we're going to go from the southern, we're going to go, whoop, we're going to go to the northern. And you're going to take that serpent, which is Draco the dragon, and you, you are going to get to that point in the center there. That's what you're going to do. That's your goal. And this is what is meant by John 3.14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. There's your carpenter. There's his cross. He's in the south. He's going to be lifted up. And what's he doing? Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a dragon. Of course, remember the dragon's keeping you from your center. That's why you got to control that serpent. You have to be in command of it. Mark 6, 16, when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. That's not Christ, that's John. He is risen from the dead. And so there's your beheading of St. John. Tons of different paintings of this. What's, what's up with uh, the beheading of St. John? What is this? Once again, this is a retelling of a Grecian myth. Eurydice and Orpheus, Grecian myth. And Orpheus, as you can see right there, Orpheus was beheaded. And usually it's next to a lyre, which is a stringed instrument, and we'll get into that. The first thing we notice in the simplest depictions of Orpheus is that the vast majority focus on the decapitated head and the lyre. And the lyre is a, you know, it's a music instrument. The dead Orpheus, in other words, continues to sing even in death. Orpheus with his lyre. There's some nymphs on the left there. They're looking into the water and they're like, oh, that's a decapitated head on the lower right there. There's Orpheus in his head next to a lyre, a musical instrument. There's another one, copy of ancient Greek vase depicted on Orphic Oracle with the severed head. This Oracle was still singing. The major stories about him are centered on his ability to charm all living things with his music. The lyre and its magical powers combined with the vocals of Orpheus. What's the first thing we hear about in John 1.1? In the beginning was the word, the sound of God's voice echoing throughout creation, creating all things. Revelation 14, 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as many as a voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice harpers harping with their harps. A harp is a string musical instrument that has a number of individual strings running at an angle to its soundboard. It's literally a lyre, L-Y-R-E. It's a variation of a harp. There's a constellation called Lyra. Lyra was often represented as a star or an eagle carrying a lyre. Now, once again, St. John is represented as an eagle. Now let's go back and read again. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Delphinus is known, the constellation Delphinus is known as Job's coffin. So he laid it in a tomb. He laid it in a coffin. And right next to that coffin, literally right across from the birds. So there's Orpheus's lyre, where St. John's head is. And that's where the disciples laid him, in Delphinus. Where's where the disciples found his body and laid him to rest? There's the decapitated head. There's the lyre. There's singing the harps of God. The sound. There's the scorpion slash eagle. Mark 6, 31 says, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves, apart into a desert place, and rest a while. And they departed in a desert place by ship privately, and then when the day was far now spent, his disciples came in and said, hey, this is a desert place. What's a desert place? Well, what exists in a desert? Is it camels and leopards? That's, what's, that's the kind of animals that you'd find in a desert place, right? So where are we in the sky? And where is the lynx, the leopard, and the camel? Of course, there's Leo Minor there too. If you notice, Leo Minor there, what's in deserts as well? Lions, 
So they went to the desert place. And where's the desert place? Well, it's by the lynx. It's by the camel. It's by the leopard. And it's by Leo Minor. Leo Major's just right there too. That's your desert place. Literally the animals you'd find in a desert. Mark 6.45 says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. Bethsaida is known as um, the house of the hunt. So the Bethsaida means house of the hunt in Hebrew. Beth means house and Saida means to hunt. So where are they now? Well, they're in the house of the hunt, the house of the hunter, Orion. Okay, so where are they now? They just went from, so they went from this desert place where there's a bunch of lions like Leo Major, uh, Leo Minor, Leo Major, uh, the lynx and the leopard and the camel. So they left that desert place and they went over to this other place. And that other place is called Bethsaida and that's the house of the hunt. And that's, of course, that's Orion, which is right by Taurus um, because he is the hunter. And right below Orion is a bunny. It's a hare and a bunny. So what is Bethsaida? It's the house of the hunt. It's the house of the Taurus. Literally the house, which is a zodiacal term, of Taurus, the bull. Orion is out hunting bulls and bunnies. Mark 6.38 says, He saith unto them, How many loaves have you? And when they knew, they say, five and two fishes, five and two fishes. And he break the loaves, five loaves of bread and gave them to the disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 people. But, you know, once again, if you've done any sort of study of astrology, this is pretty clear references to what's going on here. The, the two fishes are, are Pisces. And the five loaves of bread are what's known as Virgo, which is known as the house of bread. Virgo, the Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread. And the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. The house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to the house of bread. In Christianity, Jesus was born to a virgin in the town of Bethlehem, which literally means bread. They took up two fish, five loaves of bread, total of seven, and they fed about 5,000 men. Notice it says about 5,000 men. Five loaves plus two fishes equals seven. Do you know what multiplying one through seven is? One times two times three times four times five times six times seven is 5,040. So... They took the five loaves and the two fishes and he multiplied that and he fed all five, about 5,000 men and they were all full. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And then it says, This certain woman, who we're going to discover is Andromeda, it's a daughter, and this daughter fell at Jesus' feet. Once again, when we look at Jesus' feet, in the Zodiac Man, what is that? Well, it's Pisces. Pisces is represented by the feet. She was a Syro-Phoenician. Syro means she's from Syria. And Phoenician in Greece and Rome, the Phoenicians were famed as traders in purple. So we're in the sea. So these Syro-Phoenicians, these Phoenicians were known as seafaring merchants and they were also known for their dyes used to color priestly vestments. Purple is a, is a color that's, that's uh, attributed to royalty. So this daughter was a Syrophoenician and she was of a nation that was royal, traders in purple. This is Andromeda. Andromeda is the daughter, as we've covered before, Andromeda is the daughter of the king and queen of Ethiopia, Cepheus and Cassiopeia. She's a daughter of royalty. That's what they're saying. We have Syrophoenician, which is a daughter of royalty. 
because she is the daughter of Cassiopeia and Cepheus, and that's in the purple there. And they're pointing to Andromeda. Now, Andromeda fell at Jesus' feet, which is at Pisces right there. So fell at Jesus' feet. And because she wanted the devil cast out. And what's the devil? Well, that's Draco. That's Draco. Draco the devil that's constantly circ circling around the circumpolar constellation, constantly keeping you from your center. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. There's a constellation that's on the south side, and it's a constellation of the southern celestial hemisphere, and it's the Latin name for table, and it's called the Mensa. It's called the Mensa. There's Mensa, there's the table. So there's a table there, Southern Celestial Hemisphere, there's a table. And underneath the table, where she's casting those crumbs, are the dogs. And that's the constellation Pupus, which is literally where we get the word puppies. Canis Major and Canis Minor. Crumbs are gonna go under the table, the Mensa, the constellation and feed all the puppies which is uh, the pupus and the canis major and the canis minor the bread is going to go under the table and feed all the dogs what is salt well salt is cubic in form in crystallography the cubic or isometric crystal system is a crystal system where the unit cell is in the shape of a cube. So in poetic language, when they're saying, hey, salt, 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 this is requiring you to say, what is the symbolism of salt? Salt is cubic. And they mentioned salt seven different times. It's six resting on seven. The, the form of the cube is six around one. It's basically six sides making one geometric form. So six resting on seven. This is what Genesis is. We've talked about this plenty of times. What are they saying? Well, first off, you have to know Revelation. The city of God is a cube, Distinct, distinctly a cube. So the place where God lives is a cube. And the city lieth four square, it's a square, and the length is as large as the breadth. Then he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. It's a cube. Have salt in yourselves is what it says. And have peace with one another. That's how the chapter ends. Have the city of God within yourselves. And have peace with one another. The cube is a representation of you. Up, down, left, right, forward, reverse, six directions resting on a central axis point the axis point that's in the middle the seventh point where god rests salt is scorpio aquarius leo and taurus this is the fixed signs of the zodiac scorpio is s aquarius is a leo is l taurus is t this is the salt Wherewith will ye season it? Season. What, what is the zodiac? It's a mapping and tracking of what? The seasons. So when they came nigh into Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount, at the mount, a mountain of olives, he sendeth forth two disciples. The Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, it separates the most holy place, the Temple Mount, from the Judean desert to the east. Right by the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascends into heaven, right to the east of that is what? It's the constellations Leo, Leo Minor, uh, Cancer, which has the beehive, Lynx, and Camelopardus. Uh, Camelopardalis. I keep saying this incorrectly, so I, I apologize. Camelopardalis. It's a giraffe, the constellation of a giraffe, but it comes from the words camel and leopard. 
So in other words, this constellation is a camel and a leopard and it forms a giraffe. It's a camel and a leopard and it forms a giraffe, camel lepardus. So now we have a camel, a leopard, a giraffe, a lynx, a lion, to a couple lions, and of course a bunch of bees. There's 500 species of bees that lives in, live in where? Desert. It's the desert. You're looking at the Judean desert to the east. What is in the desert? Leo Major, Leo Minor, the camel, the leopard, the giraffe, the lynx. It's the Mount of Olives. And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man set. Loose him and bring him. Virgo, the house of bread, and Leo are over against, the village over against them. So if you take those two constellations and go over against, what are you going to have? You're going to have basically Pisces and Aquarius. And over there is a colt and it's tied upon something. What's the colt? What's a colt? It's an old English horse, a young ass. A colt is a male horse. So where did they go? They went over across and they got Pegasus. It's a big horse in the sky. Pegasus is the constellation and it's a big, essentially white horse with wings in the sky. So when it says no man ever sat, never sat on this thing, why has no man never sat on this horse? Well, because it's Pegasus, it's this horse in the sky. And it's the horse in which is only there for Jesus in this sense. That horse is specifically there for Christ to ride. Once again, there's the colt, the Pegasus, which is right, right uh, between Pisces and Aquarius and over against the Virgo and Leo. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. What are the two ways? Right by Pisces and Aquarius is where the um, your equatorial circum your circumference, right, with the, uh, essentially the equator of the earth that is put towards into the heavens, meets up with the ecliptic. So right between, right where the colt is, where never man, where upon never man sat, two ways met right there. You got two ways that are meeting. Now it's tied. It says it's tied by the door. Pisces, those two fish are tied together by a cord. Now when he loosed the colt, he was tied, once again, let's go back to this, the colt in the two ways, it was tied to the cords of Pisces. Right above the Pegasus is a circlet. It's the crown circlet. You can see the circlet is the constellation of Pisces, represents a pair of the fishes connected by a cord. It's tied. And the western fish is formed by a rough oval of seven stars. There's a circlet crown of seven stars above a horse, a flying horse in the heavens in which Jesus is going to sit on. And right below the circlet is what? The square of Pegasus. It's called the great square of Pegasus. That's what it's called. Jesus is mounting on the Pegasus, the white horse, which is only he is sitting on, riding into heaven. And while doing that, he's squaring the circle. He's circleting the great square of Pegasus. Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Now, a lot of people know that Aquarius is the, the man bearing the pitcher of water. Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. There's Aquarius, there's the man who's the water bearer, of course. Now, a lot of people don't know that the water Aquarius also has the asterism, the star asterism of the water jar. And then it says this, and wheresoever he shall go in, where's he going in? The place where the ecliptic and the equator meet.
and he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. He's going to show you a large upper room. The upper room in the house, the pole star. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. So who is Alexander and Rufus? The name Alexander originates from Greek. It means defending men, to ward off, avert, defend, to warrior, battle prowess. Now what is Rufus? Rufus in biblical name means red. That's what it means. Red. So here we have two. This guy was a father. And he fathered what? A guy that was uh, defending men. He was a battle prowess. He was a warrior. He was there to ward off, avert, and defend. So he was a warrior and he was red. That's Mars. Well, what is the ruling planet of the ram? The head. The lamb. What is the ruling planet? It's Mars. Mark 15, 22 says this. And they bring him unto this place called Golgotha, which is, comma, being interpreted, comma, the place of the skull. Now, all of a sudden, a centurion shows up. So when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he was he so cried out and gave up the ghost he said truly this man was the son of god who's the centurion well it's centaurus centaurus is a bright constellation in the southern sky and centaurus is one of greek mythology and centaurus represents a centaur we have a centurion which stood over against him When we are in the winter solstice, in the winter, right, and the, winter, and the sun is getting less on the horizon, and less and less and less, and it finally gets to a point where it's quote unquote dead for three days and resurrects. And where is all of this happening? The area of the Southern Cross. Jesus on the cross, the sun on the cross, and it's all happening. And all of a sudden, a centurion shows up, and it, where is this Centaurus in the sky? standing over the Southern Cross. So this is your winter solstice. This is um, looking at your Southern Hemisphere, 20, 21st, 22nd. And then you have those three days, and then the 21st, as you can see on the left there, December 25th, that would be Christmas. So you have the essentially the three days before that where the sun is in the tomb, he's dead. And he's standing over the Southern Cross, or the Southern, literally, crux, which is crucifixion, right by the Southern Crux, Jesus the Carpenter on a cross, is two constellations called Circanus and Norma. Norma is a carpenter square and Circanus is Latin for compass. So in other words, you can see the Southern Crux is right there. There's your centurion standing over Christ. And what is Christ? He's a carpenter. And what's literally right next to that cross? The tools of the carpenter. If you look to the south, you see the southern crux right on the horizon. And then you turn around and you look at the north, and then you see Cygnus, which is the northern cross. And where's the northern cross? It's right on the horizon. The southern crux is like uh, this, but it's like in the ground. It's like almost like touching the horizon. You turn to the northern, the northern cross is Cygnus. And it's literally on the side as if it was being buried. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they may come and anoint him. So who is Mary? Who is our Marys? Well, we already understood that. We have the Virgin Mary. Okay, so obviously Virgo Mary, the maiden, Virgo the maiden, even has a symbol of M. We have the Virgin Mary.
we can also actually consider her as well um, Mary Magdalene. Jesus cleansed her of the seven devils. So she was, she was pure. She was virgin. She was pure. She was cleansed. We have two constellations here. Coma Berenices, which is a hair of the queen, represents basically a queen. And then we have Virgo, which is right underneath that. So we have basically this queen and then a virgin. So these two women that are right there. And so we're saying, hey, there's the Mary and then there's the, the Queen Mary, if you will. The two Virgin Marys are right there. So Mary was the mother of James the last and of Joseph. Who's James? James has its ancient roots in Hebrew. And it's uh, James and Jacob, both these names mean the one who takes by the heel. And in the Old Testament, it says Jacob held on to the heel of the firstborn twin brother Esau during their birth. So this whole story of Jacob and Esau in the Old Testament is a reference to Gemini. It's a reference to the twins, as we're going to see. So while Jacob and Esau were being born, Esau is born first and Jacob holds on to the heel of Esau. Gemini, one of the stars in Gemini, a brilliant white star on the left foot of the southern twin, a bright foot of Gemini. According to uh, Bullinger, it means hurt, wounded, or afflicted, and it has been called the wound in the tendon of Achilles basically your foot, right? Your foot, your heel. And those are the two stars, Propus and Alhina, that make up the heels of Gemini. Propus, that word Propus there literally means forward foot. So the, the Greek name means forward foot, appropriate to the position as the foot of the western twin of Castor and Pollux. So James and Joseph are representative as the twins, and even their names, as we see, means the heel, one who takes the heel. So here we have Gemini right there. Then we have uh, Mary, the mother of James, and uh, James the Less and Joseph. That's Gemini. And then we have Salome. What does Salome mean? Salome means peace. It's a female name, a female name given from the Hebrew word meaning peace. Salome comes from Shalom. Shalom, like, hello, peace, peace to you kind of thing. So this is the constellation Columba. Columba is the dove. It's a faint constellation. It means dove. And so it's a symbol for peace. And this ties right into the Noah's Ark story as well. So both the Marys are there. Salome's there. The peace, the dove is there. The Virgo, the, Virgo, the Mary, everybody's there. And the tomb is empty. Mark 16, 3. And they said amongst themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. For it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, he saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, Well, the, the, main, the main body, if you will, of Ophiuchus is actually called the coffin, as you can see there. Ophiuchus, the snake handler, and there's the stars that make up its central asterism, is the coffin. It's a grave, a sepulcher. So we know there's a grave and then there's a stone. So what's the stone? Well, the stone is the keystone. It's another star asterism in Hercules. Keystone is an asterism formed by four relatively bright stars in the constellation Hercules. The asterism represents Hercules' torso. Those four dots where it says Hercules right there, right? Those four dots are considered the keystone. And that keystone is right in front of the coffin, the sepulcher. It says, when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, colon, for it was very great. They're telling you, well, the stone was pretty damn big. Okay, well, that makes sense because Hercules is the fifth largest constellation. Saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. So there's your sepulchre, there's your grave, there's the keystone that's in front of the, it's a very great, it's very big, very big stone, right in front of the coffin. Who rolled away the stone is the question, that's the big question, right? And so it's like, well, the Lord rolled away the stone. That's who rolled away the stone. The Lord did it. 
This account reports that the angel of the Lord rolled away the stone that covered the tomb. As if to show his awesome strength, the angel sat upon the stone after rolling it away. Does this look like you could say that that's Hercules sitting on the stone? Who rolls the stone away from the sepulcher? The Lord did it. Okay, well, let me ask you. Who makes the canopy of the stars move and rotate? God is rolling away the stone as he's sitting on the keystone in front of the sepulcher. They shall take up serpents. Well, this is the same as Moses lifting that ser the brazen serpent. You know the whole the whole story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is this a reference to? Well, this is a reference to Kundalini. Now, Kundalini is just an Eastern term or whatever for this process, you know. But this is literally lifting the serpents up through you. The serpents that he's saying take up are Ida and Pingala. Pingala is the extroverted, if you will, active solar nadi and corresponds to the right side of the body and the left side of the brain. Ida is the introverted lunar nadi and corresponds to the left side of the body and the right side of the brain. We already know that we have to follow the gospel. We have to follow God's story. So what are those two serpents? Well, those two serpents are Hydra and Hydras. Hydra literally means water snake, and so does Hydra. They, they both you know, Hydra means hy like water, hydro, and then so they're snakes, so they're water snakes. And why are they water? Well, because they're in the canopy of the stars, the water above and the water below. So they're water snakes. They're in the stars above. Hydras means male water snake, as opposed to Hydra which is a much larger constellation that represents a female water snake. One's a male and one's a female. One, the female is really big, really long, as you can see on the top there, that's the female. And then the male, as you can see, it forms a, a triangle. It's very small, pretty small constellation. Hydra is one of the biggest constellations. Hy Hydrus is very small. As you can see, Hydrus is a triangular constellation, as you can see right there. And it's in the Southern hemisphere, Southern part. Triangle constellation right near the bottom. Well, that's your sacrum. And there's your sacrum, which is a triangular bone just below the lumbar vertebrae, which is literally what starts your spinal column. So this is where it looks like in relation to our story, though. And that's what's important. So we have Ida and Pingala, the two opposite serpents that, are in, that intertwine up the pole of the shaft of the human being. And where, is all, where are these serpents? Well, there's Hydra, which is literally the constellation right above Centurion, or the Centaurus, which is literally right above the cross. And what's below the cross? Hydras. There it is. So there, there's a visualization of the center pole of the stars. There's a center pole, an imaginary center pole through that, that connects the southern point to the northern point. And everything revolves around us. Well, that southern point, you see the Hydras, and that leads right all the way up to Draco, which is the serpent at the very top. Hydra, Hydras, and Draco all revolving around a center pole. And that, my friends, is your Ida, your Pingala, and your Shashumna. And what's at the very top, your Shashumna? And what's at the very top, Draco, which revolves around what? The northernmost point in the heavens, the pole star. Now, what is this center pole? Well, it's the, it represents the center pole in you. This is the axis mundi. It's the Latin term for the axis of the earth between the celestial poles. A line or stem through the earth's center connecting its surface to the underworld and the heavens around which the universe revolves. This is the axis of the rotation of the celestial sphere. They're one and the same. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
God spelled glad tidings announced by Jesus, a good spell from good God, and spell, which means a story or a message. So in other words, when you say gospel, really what you're saying is good story, good message, or it can be basically abbreviated as God's story. Okay, where is God's story though? Well, it's exactly where we've been talking about. It's the canopy of the stars. It's the firmament. It's literally God's story. It's the very things that are incorruptible. They're available to all people. They're above all people. Tell every creature about God's story. God's story. His story. It's written right here. and written right there.